All right, everybody, how you doing tonight? Thank you all for coming out on a rainy evening to kind of dream a little bit about the future of the neighborhood. I am Rich Conti, the Chief Wonder Officer here at the Science Museum of Virginia. You're sitting in the largest screen in the entire Commonwealth. Uh, we can actually take you to any place in the known universe. Uh, this is where we do astronomy and a lot of other great stuff. Who's been to the museum the last couple of years? Uh, not too bad. All right, so if you haven't been, we've been doing a little bit of work to this place. We've put a lot into it. We've actually transformed the entire interior of the museum. We've got the inside that we want. So now we're ready to move outside. So what we want to do tonight is share a little bit about what we're planning to do here on our site. We've got some great folks. Councilwoman Gray is going to talk to you all a little bit tonight. Trevor Dickerson from the Scott's Edition Group. Mark Olinger here from City Planning. i got to give a shout out to Dr. Richard Gruber, my trustee over here on the front row. Woo! Give it up for Dr. Gruber. Thank you for humoring me. All right, so here we go. So here's kind of an aerial. This shot was taken a couple of years ago, really, of our site. I wasn't here then, but people tell me if you went back to the early 90s, we used to have a liquor store in the parking lot. Does anybody remember that? Woo, there we go, this gentleman in the front. We also had a gas station on the corner over here. Does anybody remember the gas station? Yeah, so they're gone now. So we're making some improvements. But here's kind of the site now. Uh, as we looked at how we could transform it and how we could really make it more special, we had to deal with one thing. What do you think the one thing was? What? The pulse. No, how'd y'all get here tonight? Where'd you put your cars? Yeah, that's an issue, right? You need a place to put your car. So that's a big old giant parking lot out front. And so the plan is to get rid of that. So what we're doing is we're going to build a parking deck so that we can scrape up that asphalt and transform it into a beautiful civic green space. It's the Science Museum's gift to the community. It is for you all, no gates, no fences, natural vegetation, something that we think will be really beautiful, a great place to reflect public art that tells a science story, something that we can all be proud of in the community. We don't have enough green space in the community. So we're going to put six or so acres of that right in the front. But first, we need that. That's kind of an idea of what this parking deck might look like. Uh, we're really close to getting this bad boy out to bid. We hope to break ground sometime this calendar year. It'll take a year to build it. And then once we got it open, there's a place for you to put your cars. Then we can scrape up the asphalt and start working on the green space, which could look something like that. You're supposed to go, ooh, right? Better, huh? So we're thinking along broad, we want like a tree-lined, uh, what do we call it? Like a colonnade, what's the right word? L.A. An L.A. A tree-lined L.A. Protection from the street, right? A lot of shade. Again, we're thinking all native species, a little bit of undulation, a little bit of topography. Lovely, smaller, intimate, reflective spaces. If you've been to Brant Park in New York, uh, we're kind of you know modeling it a little bit after that. Uh, but just a you know terrific, interesting kind of public green space that you can just come and watch the sunset or meet folks up. Uh, we'll have some maybe some light interpretation. We don't envision doing programming out there. We still got a lot of space behind the museum if we want to do a concert or a big festival or something like that. So uh, in any event, that's kind of what we're thinking. All right. Sound all right? Yeah. All right, so there's more, much more to dream about. I know I've been here for 11 years, and I drive by the Diamond site every day and think, man, that should be something fabulous and special, and I know it's going to be at some point. So Councilwoman Gray is here to, I think, elicit your input to dream about what that could look like. Councilwoman Gray, let's give her a big hand. Sounds like this. I wish I could sing or do stand up, but I don't do either one. So you just get me. Um, but I want to first of all thank um, the Science Museum of Virginia for hosting us. This is amazing. And um, the only thing Jeremy forgot to do was put my picture up on this big screen. I'm kidding. He thought I was serious, and he got really like. You sent a picture over, and I was like, yes, you didn't get it? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he never knows when I'm joking. Um, so Jeremy has been doing a lot of work with the Scott's Edition Boulevard Association um, because it is the hottest neighborhood, and it's the hottest neighborhood, not just because everybody's so fabulous, but because there's so many rooftops drawing in so much heat, and that heat stays there. It's like one big giant 
parking lot and rooftop area. So it, it becomes about 16 degrees hotter in Scott's Edition on some of the hottest days. So if you can imagine the past few days, how many ambulance calls, how many air conditioning units had to work overtime just to try to keep people cool in the Scott Sedition neighborhood. So that's one of the things that we have been talking about for the overall development of the area. I know that I'm way behind because Mark Olinger and Craig and I sat down last week. There was a plan from 2011. There are plans from I don't even know how far back, but we have um, found most of those plans and we're going to be putting a link up to those plans so um, you'll be able to see what input has been received to date and then we want to get some input about what you want to see happen on the boulevard. I know there are lots of plans. Let's keep an open mind and um, Craig had a handout with some of the VCU plans. They submitted three different drawings to the General Assembly for the ABC site and they've purchased two more sites along that area and once it's owned by VCU we don't have a whole lot of say in what happens with the property but I'd like to be able to get on the front end and work with them to talk about some community benefits and things that we could ask for from them as, um, as a change or an exchange for some of the inconveniences that the neighborhoods and surrounding areas might see, and also the, the loss of the tax base for those properties that have been purchased. So that's kind of where this thinking is. This is the first of what um, Mark and I talked about, three meetings. I really appreciate Mark legitimizing this whole thing um, as our planning director. So I'm going to look at the agenda. I think I hand it off to you at this point. Um, no, I give it to Trevor Dickens Dickerson, the president of the Scott Sedition Boulevard Association. Sorry, Trevor. Thank you, Councilwoman Craig, and uh, thank you to the Science Museum for having us as well. We appreciate the opportunity to come here together as a, as a neighborhood and um, you know look towards the future and, as Rich said, kind of dream about what could be. Um, like you said, my name is Trevor Dickerson. I'm the uh, president of the Scott's Edition Bull Art Association. So we are the neighborhood association that encompasses this uh, tract of land that we're kind of looking at here. A lot of people don't know we expanded our bounds in uh, 2015 uh, to include the area all the way north to 95. Uh, we're bounded south on Broad Street, west on uh, 195, and east on Hermitage. So a lot of people don't know this tract of land is kind of within our purview. So, um, you know, we've been kind of a... Um, you know, the hot spot for the past, you know, five to seven years, come up on a decade maybe, and everything has, you know, exploded in, in that time. So, um, it's been, it's been great, but it's also been a time of, you know, great growing pains. So, one of the things we want to make sure we do, um, is, is make sure that any development along our Thrash Boulevard or along the, um, the Diamond, you know, area and corridor there is really, you know, has a lot of thought put into it. I mean, this is one of the biggest, you know, tracts of undeveloped land we have within the city of Richmond, I'm pretty sure. So we want to make sure that, you know, that it's quality development that's done right, that's done, you know, as, as much as we have control of, is, is done to the, um, you know, the wishes of our, of our neighborhood. Um, but yeah, we exist to, you know, kind of work with both businesses and residents, for those of you who haven't uh, already talked to uh, in the past, and, uh, you know, we're trying to come up with, you know, ways to make sure our city's infrastructure keeps up with, uh, you know, the fast rate of growth that we've had in the neighborhood, which has been a challenge at times. Uh, you know, getting uh, more lighting put in, sidewalks, green space, um, you know, working with great partners like Jeremy and the Science Museum, we've been, you know, able to kind of uh, come to terms with some of that stuff, like, you know, getting the green space in place and doing some uh, studies on what can be done to, you know, make use of the little bit that we do have. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we're open to hear your questions and concerns and kind of lead this discussion as well as we go forth. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Mark Olinger at this point. Jeremy, I'm sorry. She left me out, I'm leaving you out now. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Okay, yeah, the clicker. Cool. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so you've heard a couple people talk about uh, the work that we've been doing here between Scott's Edition and the Science Museum. I just thought I'd give a little quick overview of what we found to kind of uh, maybe paint a picture of what we could envision some of the, uh, the ecological benefits of what can happen on the Diamond property. Um, 
really fast. Uh, the National Climate Assessment basically comes to the conclusion that we need to be preparing for a hotter, wetter, sneezier, and wheezier Virginia with longer, stronger heat waves, more intense, flashy precipitation, much like what we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and then, you know, longer allergy seasons and potentially um, poorer air quality overall. So as a climate scientist, it's very um, uh, something about uh, learning more about our city right now so that we can better understand what the future holds for us. So um, speaking of these heat events, days like what we've just gone through, where the heat index is over 100 degrees, 105, could become... Um, uh, something that's a little bit more common, about 40 more days per year. We see about 10 right now um, by the mid-century. So those sorts of long stretches of intense heat um, are expected to become more common given uh, continued emissions of heat-trapping gases. Um, this also has a huge effect on our, on our um, health. Um, here is down here from 60 degrees all the way up to the, the weekend that we just had, about 100, 105, 110. And I've worked with the Virginia Department of Health to discover that as it gets hotter, more and more people are going to the hospital. So this is, up on this is the number of people as a percentage of all people going to the hospital for heat-related illnesses. And if you watched or saw the um, Richmond Times-Dispatch, uh, 600, over 600 people were admitted to um, or emergency centers or urgent care centers for heat-related illnesses over this last um, weekend. Most of those being uh, middle-aged men, um, and uh, but still all across almost all age groups. So we have this, um, we, we, heat is still the number one uh, weather-related fatality, uh, even more so than hurricanes and tornadoes. Um, and while we don't see a lot of people Dying due to heat, we do see a large morbidity impact or, or an impact on, on sicknesses. Um, and it's partially due, at least in Richmond, to, to this. So this is our parking lot, which will be gone someday, as you heard from Rich. But if we were to fly into this picture and touch the hottest place, think in your head where you would go to touch the hottest surface to the touch, okay? And just think in your head, and on three, we're just going to say it out loud, okay? So no, not one person's giving the answer, we'll just kind of... And throw out your hypothesis on three. One, two, three. Ow. Okay, nice. All right, now where's the coolest spot to the touch? And you can't say the broadberry. On three. One, two, three. Okay, nice. So what's great about a science museum is we have really cool toys to investigate the natural world around us. So by using a thermal camera, we can actually figure out what is the warmest surface. The brightest colors are the hottest, the coolest colors, or the uh, deepest purples are the coolest areas. Under the tree, it's about 90 degrees in this picture. On the asphalt, it's about 170. Uh, and when you look at how this plays out over the course of the entire city, um, well, first, like some other things that are really interesting. All these different color cars. Here you can see this white van. It has a very different uh, surface temperature than the darker cars around it. Then even the types of pavements and like this white stone bench has a very much lower temperature than the um, like a checkerboard pattern here. It's all due to the color. Um, so thinking about how this translates to the design of a neighborhood like Scott's Edition or a future um, diamond neighborhood, um, we can learn a lot from something just like this. And in fact, in 2017, we measured the city's temperature. And this is where Kim came uh, with that statement that the spot in Scott's Edition was 16 degrees warmer than the coolest place, which was in the shaded J James River Park system. Um, 16 degree difference between two places at the exact same time during a heat wave. And a lot of the city, um, you can see the kind of uh, pattern here. Uh, that plays out in other things too. Oh, sorry, here's, here's our area. Here's the Science Museum. Here's Arthur Ashe Boulevard. And the deeper reds here, of course, correspond to the warmer temperatures. So. The Diamond and Scott's Edition are both figuratively and literally the hottest spots in the in the in the city, um, and of course that's a lot has to do with the canopy. We have very low urban canopy in this area of the city of Richmond. We also have higher uh, impervious surfaces, or those hard, dark surfaces like roads and bricks. Um, and while maybe not as much as concentrations of poverty, um, this too also has an effect on whether someone can adapt to those heat waves in, in the sense of buying a fan or an air conditioning unit. 
Uh, and when we look at these ambulance responses uh, from the Richmond Ambulance Authority, you can really see how this correspondence, this kind of like bow shape, plays out in the areas of higher ambulance responses. We were actually reached out to um, uh, by several news organizations lately to, to talk about this work. So um, anyway, this is breaking down the neighborhoods that are the coolest. Big blue bars mean that they're relatively cooler than the rest of the city, and the big red bars are uh, relatively warmer. And so like I said, Scott's Edition here and the Diamond, currently the warm, some of the warmest, hottest neighborhoods in the city. Uh, and you know, if you live in these areas or you know people that live in these areas, very shady versus very much not shady. So uh, how do we think about that in the design of a space? And this is something that I love. Uh, urban design and climate science actually go hand in hand in that if we look at something like a, a single family neighborhood, which we don't have a lot of in Scott's Edition or in the Diamond, but these are three possible things that you could do to that neighborhood to add more people. So as you know, a lot of people are moving to Richmond and where are we gonna put them? We have to increase the density. So here's one option, option one, and then option two, which still has a lot of uh, road, way, and um, parking spaces and that sort of thing. And then over here, option C has some reflective um, uh, uh, surfaces instead of the dark asphalt roads. We can treat those like a video game in a climate model. Basically ask, if we were gonna go from this neighborhood to one of these three, what happens to the environment? Perhaps unsurprisingly, this design actually increases the temperature by six degrees Fahrenheit, and this option over here decreases the temperature by three degrees relative to what was there. So the design, the physical design of our neighborhoods has a huge impact on the temperature outcome that we experience. This has an impact on our health, our energy use, our air quality, the types of bugs and organisms that choose to live there, the types of plants that will survive, all of this can be incorporated into how we dream about what this neighborhood can look like. And um, of course, it's not just heat, but these impervious surfaces also funnel um, stormwater into the river and cause these kind of urban flooding events, whereas you can retreat it with a green filter, which we also have here at the Science Museum, so we're gonna be doing over the next several years. So I just wanted to give you a broad overview of the kinds of um, climate-related stressors that we experience and the exacerbation of those stressors in the urban environment simply because of the way that we design and build it. So um, in any event, uh, I think now we actually transition over to what the big plan is, uh, or at least part of the plan, from um, the uh, planning director, Mark Hollinger. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure being here, everybody. The second time I've given a presentation in this room, and it's all inspiring. And, uh, of course, it's all inspiring to have presentations this large. I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to try to fly through them as quickly as possible. Oops, that is because I want to touch briefly on, you know, we talk about the boulevard in this larger area, and I want to be, uh, give people some background on what we've been working on fundamentally over the last four years as part of the Pulse Corridor, and then touch on the end about Richmond 300, which looks at the balance of the area. So in July of 17, two years ago, Council adopted the Pulse Corridor Master Plan for the BRT that runs along Broad Street, and kind of the thinking that we went through on that was to take a look at kind of the half mile walk shed, like what is happening around the whole stations that we need to think about as it relates to creating an environment that will support ERT and at the same time create an environment that will help create new neighborhoods. So that's the half mile walk shed and you can see in the discussion we're going to have tonight, it basically takes us to the Arthur Ashe Bridge and the railroad tracks. For argument's sake, that's where we're going to end up. Just a little bit about demographics, I think this is interesting on the route, one quarter of the population and two thirds of the jobs in the city are along the BRT corridor. So when we talk about other BRTs in the city, we're playing catch up with this one because there's a lot of people and a lot of jobs within a quarter mile of the, of the, of the line. 29% of the property is tax exempt, not surprising given there's a lot of state and municipal institutions here. 
But when you think again about a city that is only 62 and a half square miles and not in our lifetime will we get to 63 square miles, we have to think about how we program and plan for, I'm not going to say every square foot, but it's pretty darn close. 35% of the land surface parking lot. So we're running through the heart of the city, yet a third of the land is still surface parking lot. These are the land uses along the corridor. These are the tax exempt parcels. This is the map of the surface parking lots. And last night at council, we adopted a rezoning in the Monroe Ward neighborhood, a number of rezonings in Monroe Ward, the development of a plan of development overlay for 320 acres. And a lot of that follows what came out of the Pulse Corridor Plan because we talked about being a number of priority station areas along the 14. So all station areas are exciting and great. Six of them are a little more, um, have more opportunity in them than the other eight. So last year we did Cleveland. Two years ago we did Cleveland. We are working right now on Main Street Station as part of the small area plan that we're doing down in Chaco Bottom. The Arts District at Maggie L. Walker Plaza is the, the rezoning that occurred last night, and our hope is to get through all of those by the end of next year. The overarching goals are compact and mixed, connected, and viable. So when we think about what happens in this area, and when I talk about the boulevard, I want to go a little bit to what Trevor said about Greater Scotts. I don't know if that's the right name or not long term. But if you think about Greater Scotts Edition, that's 928 acres in the city of Richmond. When you think about the 60 acres, plus or minus, that the city owns is kind of in the center, but when I think about what's happening in the larger community, I really do think about the 928. That'll become a little more evident a little bit later. So these are the adopted land use elements of the plan. So I want to make sure everybody understood that when we adopted the plan two years ago, we laid out along the corridor recommendations for land use. Land use is not zoning, and I'll get to zoning in a moment, but land use is the way that the city develops over time and the uses we expect to see and the way they relate to each other. So if you look in this one, we created a mixed um, uh, industrial mixed use. We had nodal mixed use that took us up to the railroad tracks, and that nodal mixed use basically took us down to Lombardi. We kept some industrial here, institutional at UMFS, what we call corridor mixed use along the rod. The real interesting piece is what happens here, and we'll get to that a little bit later as we talk about um, north of the railroad track. <coughs> the interesting thing about industrial mixed use, we did this in Manchester a few years ago when Scott's Edition took off. It was zoned in one. I'll show you that in a moment. Every single project that came in front of the city had to go through a special use permit, which is a special land use approvals process that sends you through the Planning Commission, public hearing, and ultimately to council. Like, I don't know, Mr. Rodney Poole, Chair of the Planning Commission here, when was our first Scotch edition? 2007, 2008? 2007. 2007. Planning Commission said, we're not really so keen on this mixed-use concept because we'd like to keep it an industrial area. Planning Commission said no to the project. Our 2001 plan said yes to industrial. Council said, no, oh, we kind of like that mixed-use idea. And when that happened, we were off to the races. So in the last 12 years, we have done a number of things to try to support and enhance the revitalization of Scott's Edition. And one of them is industrial mixed use, which means residential and fabrication and industrial can work together and live together. And for most of us, industrial is everything but the most noxious uses. Uh, petrochemical, rabbit slaughter, like I like to bring up occasionally. All these other things that we really don't want to see, that everybody wants to work in. Everybody works in an office in some manner, other than that's a permitted use in the M1. The residential was not, so we create that mixed use. Nodal mixed use. 
was our suggestion in the plan that this area is special and can get developed differently, and we should take a comprehensive look at that. We'll get back to that in a moment. These are our overlay elements, this is what I adopted last night. Our belief is whatever happens in this corridor needs to be urban. And there's lots of different ways you can get to there from here, but we suggested that we like to look at a rehab bonus, maybe surface parking isn't a primary use. What about open space? The two neighborhoods that have grown the fastest over the last few years, particularly as the change in the character of those neighborhoods, Scott's Edition in Manchester, practically zero open space. We gotta do better than that as we think about the balance of the neighborhood. Some form regulation and looking at how we might make affordable housing uh, work better in this area by providing some opportunities for bonus. These are the six POD overlay characteristics that got adopted last night. This is what we're looking at for all of the items that occur along the corridor. I'm a big believer in holding the corner. I saw an old plan council person, Gray talked about all the plans. I saw a plan from 1961, 63. One of the first things they talked about in urban design is helping hold the corner, create that place where people want to be. How do you do setbacks and stepbacks to relate to existing buildings? Entrances facing the street. I still get projects that have all the entrances coming off the parking lot in areas like this. We cannot do that. Think about how you handle transparency. Make it feel comfortable where people can see in and see out. In areas where we have a lot of old warehouses that have been converted, the Department of Historic Resources says windows, not so much. So we have lots of blank walls. We have lots of internally facing uses. Let's bust those out and create more vibrancy at the street level. Facade articulation, let's just not have 1,000 foot long buildings that are the same thing start to stop. And if we're going to have screen parking in the interim, let's make sure it looks good. Our parking consultants, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, Desmond is doing a parking study for us. Scott's Edition is one of those areas that says, you guys have really bad looking parking lots. I think it's time we begin to change that. So here are the six priority station areas. We mentioned that before. Just want to do a quick update on this is the Cleveland. This is the proposed. You saw that. So that is kind of the proposed land uses. This is a quick statement. We'll invite this on kind of the goals of the area. We also visualized what that might mean. So this is a cross section, which means a slice through broad, north to south, from roughly Marshall Street down to close to Grace near the old Comfort Inn, about how development might occur on the north side of Broad versus the south side of Broad, draw your attention to how we did this reverse angle against residentially zoned areas, so we pushed the mass against the street, not against the alley. And then we looked at the zoning, and there's a lot of zoning that was in that area, and we said, that doesn't really conform with what we wanted to do, so the recommendation was let's rezone the area, and that was done, I believe, last September, two Septembers ago, and that was the final zoning plan. So the adopted zoning in half of the Arthur Ashe Boulevard area roughly has been put in place for the last two years. So when projects come in now, we look at them against the six standards, we look at them for you know, their, their transparency, how they relate to the street, are they adding value to the neighborhood? And that goes through an administrative process, not a legislative process. So you can see the Science Museum isn't quite in, and stuff north of the bridge isn't quite in. The TOD, as I like to call it, unabashed urbanism, covers most of the area. So what does that mean? That means we want urban buildings, urban form, maximum of 12 stories. Some relationship to parking easement, a parking easing. So we try, why do I need to have meet zoning requirements for parking if the goal of BRT is to get people out of their car? So the idea has been we're reducing parking standards. One last one because uh, Rich brought it up and I love looking at it. So this is the proposed land uses along the Allison or the Science Museum Station and the Allison Street Station. And Rich has got better drawings, this is a little older, but our goal is what does Broad Street begin to feel like 
If you think about this great eight acre green space on the north side of Broad, how does that help us on the south side of Broad? And so our goal in visualization is we've got $6 million to fund streetscape improvements from roughly Harrison to the, uh, Hamilton. So we're going to start that in the next year or two. We can begin to infill those vacant lots, the one-story buildings that have kind of outlived their usefulness. And oh, by the way, we need to figure in the people, how people go north to south, east to west through this district. So that's kind of where we are on half the neighborhood. So the plan has been done, the rezonings have occurred, the land use plan has been discussed, but we haven't figured out yet what happens on the north side of Broadway. That's why we're here tonight. So I want to talk just a minute about why we do master planning. Richmond 300 is the, the item that we chose, the name, because we will be 300 years old in roughly 20 years. What is the city we want to have? How does that city present itself to us who live here and visitors who visit? It's taken us 280 years approximately to get here. And I did a presentation at the branch a few months ago. 1946 was our first master plan. Most of the buildings you see today in the city of Richmond were here. Not part of the Chesterfield annexation in 1970, but a significant portion of the, pot of the building stock that was here in 1946 is still here. And so time moves slowly in those cities, and it's really often about how we deal with the incremental changes that allow growth to continue, because Harlan Bartholomew, who was a planner in 1946, would recognize Richmond today. Fully believe that. So when people are very concerned, oh my gosh, everything's going to change in a heartbeat, does, nothing really changes in a heartbeat. What we're really trying to do is set a tone and a mission and some values, create land use opportunities to let that occur, and then let that occur over time. That's the bottom. That's, that's Richmond, about a quarter of a square mile. Our last full update was 2001. We haven't had a comprehensive update since 2001. That's why we're doing it now. Uh, we've done a number of other small area plans that have been incorporated, but again, we have not looked at the big picture. Master plans really help answer three questions for us. Where can growth occur? Where can change occur? What kind, so that's often handled through zoning. We talk about capital improvement projects. The Planning Commission sees the CIP, at least at an edited version, before Council sees it the day the budget is introduced. The reason that is, is that second one. How does the budget support <coughs> capital improvements to make the master plan a reality? So in this neighborhood, along the corridor in Greater Scott's Edition again, there's a thing or two we'd probably like to do to make this a much better neighborhood. Sidewalks, street trees, new streets in areas where we don't have streets now. What's the pattern of development in this area? That's what capital improvements linking with the master plan gets you, and that talks about public projects. We're right there in the planning process where the blue star is. So we started this a little over a year and a half ago, having some public meetings. We've established working groups in five areas to take a look at what that 30-year vision for the city is and how do we get there from here. So tonight's discussion is very timely because we're beginning to look at how all of these pieces begin to fit together. Not too late to have a say. Just a few things from the book we introduced, and if you want to see more of this, please go to Richmond 300. We've added roughly 30,000 people since 2000. This will be the first time in three censuses, 30, 40, 50 since the 30, 40, and 50 censuses that the city has actually grown at each one of those censuses. I know my staff's getting tired of hearing me say this, but I love to say it anyway. I've worked in growing cities and I've worked in declining cities, and I can always tell you it's much better to work in a, a growing city because planners don't know how to handle decline. And cities don't know how to handle decline. So we've added a lot of people. That change in the population is emerging in places that we didn't think were possible 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 
It's declining in other places because of shifting family size and all of that. We still have issues in the south side, unfortunately, particularly as it relates to education and employment. We were 5,800 people per square mile in 1950. The same geography today, 3,840. So even if we just went back and matched our old pop person, now again, that's largely populations, people per household, if you would just match that, we'd be over 300,000 people. So this is a city that can accommodate more people. The question for us is where does, the, where does that go? Um, most of the city's land use will not change. Most of the city who is in low density single family homes, yeah, there are things we might want to suggest in the plan long term if you Lots of cities are talking about allowing two families and three families and three single family districts. But by and large, those aren't the big changes. The ch places where change can occur, I think, in the city is in areas like Greater Scotts Edition, Greater Manchester. We still got stuff in the downtown we can do and along our corridors. We have lots of industrial, we have lots of commercially zoned property in the city it is really not very active and, and, and good commercial. And there's opportunities there, I think, to create new neighborhoods as we think about how the city emerges. Single family is a third of our land use. We have an average walk score. What does that matter? 51. The idea of walk score is people are now starting to say, we like more walkable neighborhoods. We're kind of there. But we're not quite there yet because there's not enough things, there's not enough people to walk to or things to walk to in this larger area yet, but we're getting closer. As people, as you get less and less walkable, the challenges of getting people to these community activity centers and, and creating the opportunity to create a community becomes much more challenging. We're hoping to do that with the changes to bus system, getting more people within a half mile of a frequent bus. Trying to cut down on traffic does make the city more walkable, but a safer walkable city as well. Get us more parkland in those areas of the city that are struggling for parkland right now. As Jeremy has said, as Councilperson Gray has said, people like parks. And as we're going to add forth, I mean, the, one of the studies came out in 16 on the, on the boulevard, on the, on the relocation of the baseball stadium off the boulevard site. They said in 20 years we could have 4,000 housing units on the boulevard site alone. We need to think comprehensively and holistically that if we're going to create new neighborhoods, we need to think about how open space isn't just an adjunct. It's not the last thing we do. I would often argue in redevelopment districts it should be one of the first, one of the first things we do because it helps set the tone for what happens in the balance of the neighborhood. Think about Monroe Park. I mean, how it is the center of the life around it from both a design standpoint and from a use standpoint. It is the center of that area. We need to think more about that. And if you look, we're kind of in the middle of the pack. Minneapolis, many years ago, made the decision every resident was going to live within six or eight blocks of a park. So they got a 97% on their access to park because everybody lives between six or eight blocks of a park. This goes back to what Jeremy was talking about a little bit, about how do we cut down the urban heat island effect. And this is where, if we added 30,000 more people, where would they go? And under a variety of scenarios, by 2037, we could be somewhere between 260 and 300,000 people. I'm not sure we'll ever get to 340, but I think we could easily get to 260, which would be higher than our number in 1970 when we attached Chesterfield, and it will allow us... The question isn't about density. The question isn't really about population at times. The question for us as we look at the master plan is, everybody says, and this is almost a universal, we like to be close to X, a grocery store, a library, a park, whatever. It takes people to make that happen. So if we're in a very low density environment, the target area to get those people to come to that grocery store on the far southwest side is much different than if I got 10 or 15,000 people within a mile or two 
with lots of money to spare, which is why we have three grocery stores at Elwood and Thompson. So the idea is, what is that population, I don't even want to use the word density, but population that makes things that people say they'd like to have in their city possible. If you don't want more people living in your neighborhood, then you might not get that grocery store or other things you want to have happen. So we have five specific work groups that have been meeting since July. Um, these are land use, transportation, economic development, housing, and environment. Our goal is to begin to merge those. So we've collected a lot of ideas from September through February. We begin the process of sorting and filtering. We're beginning to develop those recommendations now. We will refine them at a series of community consultations later this fall, and we hope that many of you will show up and help us refine the plan. So here's the outline. We've created land use as high quality places because it's really about that. Nobody ever falls in love with a land use map, at least I haven't found one. People fall in love with places. So how do we create land uses that create the high quality of places that people fall in love with? How do we create opportunities for transportation for all folks? Inclusive housing, housing possibilities for all residents of the city of Richmond. I think one of the great attributes of this city is the variety of housing you can get here. It is unbelievable. Let's make it more attainable to more of the people more of the time. A diverse economy. This area is a growing economic engine. Unlike Manchester, in some respects, which largely started out as a housing project, number of housing projects, and only lately has become more of a mixed use with some job potential, the number of projects I see coming through Scott's edition that are economic development related, not pure housing related, I'm going to guess jobs outpace housing and projects right now. We've got some developers in Scott's edition, they might speak differently, but man, I'm seeing a lot of great economic development projects. And how do we do that in an environment that is sustainable and allows us to be the best we can be? So, forget that one. <laughs> one of the things that we're going to talk about, and I'll show you on the map in a moment, is the concept of hubs or activity centers, or we haven't figured out the name yet, but what is it that draws people to these areas to help build community in a way that thinks about the neighborhood growing. So we've got a bunch of those existing in the corridor. But before I get to that, I just want to say the existing land use category, we have 31. We're a city of 250,000 people. We're not San Francisco where they do a master plan for every block. We don't need 31 land use categories. That confuses people, confuses us. So we're trying to get it down to about 10 different land use categories and we'll talk about that and show that on the map in just a moment this is the city-wide draft future land use so we'll get to um, we'll get to our section in a moment but it fundamentally doesn't change the lay of the land what we do is we've created low density residential and medium density residential we don't think High density residential should exist outside of other uses, so we don't have that. We've created the idea of the downtown, obviously. And then these nodal mixed use, again, these areas of high intense utilization that are creating their own neighborhoods over time and land that is either underutilized or transitioning from a prior use. We got corridors, we got neighborhood mixed use, we got a lot, we have a much narrower band. Because many neighborhoods in the city are much more alike than they are different. Many of them were built within a few years of each other, where they're in the northeast, south side of town. And so the, the character of the neighborhoods may be slightly different. The people who live there may be slightly different. The attitudes they may have may be slightly different. How they view themselves in relationship to the city might be different. But the housing stock and the neighborhood stock is very similar. This is a fuel in the transportation. This is the step on the next step. So like I said, we're coming up upon this point right here. Our hope would be this time next year we have an adopted master plan. That means we don't have zoning adopted. That means we have land use adopted. 
There's three of us. All three of us are here tonight. Marianne Pitts, Risa Peachin are both here assisting me and helping so we can answer questions. But I want to leave you with two last slides. Number one, this is the map of Greater Scotts Edition as we've talked about it. It's 928 acres, 743 net acres, and a va assessed valuation of 1.2 billion. Let me just give you a, a bit. I don't think most of us understand the size of this area. You can take the fan and you can take the museum district, put it into Greater Scotts Edition, and still have a couple hundred acres left. Last night at the council, when we did all the rezoning in the Monroe Ward, the POD overlay district from 9th to Belvedere, broad to the downtown expressway. 320 acres. We could put three Monroe Wards in Greater Scotts Edition. So the idea is, and only in 2019 has the assessed valuation of Greater Scotts passed the Museum District. In 2017, it was less than the Museum District. It still drags behind the fan. So there's lots of opportunity. And this is the draft land use map for this part of the city. So, as I said before, here's downtown, and here is the area we're talking about. The railroad track kind of acting as kind of breaking this up into quads. And I do want to touch base on a couple of things that are out there that maybe people don't know about yet, but I want to touch about how it relates to this neighborhood particularly. We have been working uh, collaboratively with Public Works and Parks and Rec about the establishment of additional ways to get around this area. We were fortunate enough to get some money through the Smart Scale program from the Department of Transportation to basically take us from there under the tracks and down the broad. So you don't have to cross the boulevard to get to this side of Arthur Ashe. And you don't have to cross, you don't have to be on the bridge. That's going to come in a couple of years, but we're beginning the study for that now. And ultimately the study will be, how do we get from roughly here, or how do we even get across the railroad to get to this piece of the neighborhood and take you from here, under the bridge, maybe down to Lombardi, but certainly down to Allen. So all of a sudden, on this side, we begin to think about linkages. We've also talked about how do you go from this site and get across the tracks to this area up here. I think if you're, in, if you're in the upper floor of this building and you look across towards the diamond site, you think, man, that's so close. Why does it feel like it takes so long to get there? So our goal has been to stay in this part of the area with the recommendations that came out of the Pulse Plan. The noble mixed use, industrial mixed use, uh, and we're seeing a lot of activity, not here as much, but now starting to see it in the Overbrook only Hermitage area. Our recommendation then is, so how, what do we do on this side of the railroad tracks? And we begin talking about this central spine, this central cone of Arthur Ashe and Hermitage kind of acting as that nodal mixed use over the next 20 years. We still have industrial mixed use flanking it. And then we looked at how do we create opportunities for smaller areas. So we've got this, this smaller area here. We've got this kind of Scots edition around the Cleveland station. This is the lands that the Sauer family owns where the Whole Foods is going in and other activity. So what does the rest of this neighborhood begin to look like. The question we're asking ourselves, these, the downtown and this Greater Scotts Edition are so close, are they going to be in competition with one another? Our hope would be that they're not in competition with one another, but we don't know that yet. We're, we're working on it. They're seeing a different character of development, that as this area begins to emerge, maybe that will change. We've been meeting with VDOT, there was a meeting with VDOT folks either today or tomorrow, 
And we're going to go talk about how they put a high priority on a number of projects on I-95 over the next 20 years. And one of those is the Boulevard, the Arthur Ashe Interchange. 95 throughout the city needs fixing. But one of the highest priorities of all the priorities that needs fixing is how do we handle this, getting people in and out. That's it from where I stand today. The clock won't work, so this must be my last slide. I forget, so I'd be happy to entertain. Comes the person you want the mic back and we talk. Walk the mic around. Yeah. While she's coming, I just want to make one last comment about how I think neighborhoods evolve. You know, in the past, as I looked through the former master plans for the city, former adopted master plans for the city. The concern everybody had was, well, people from outside are going to come in, and there's going to be this great AM inflow and PM outflow. I think what we've seen in some of the developments that have occurred recently is that the, the migration, the transportation, the, the, the morning rush isn't quite as deep as it used to be. Businesses are coming to this part of the city because this is where the employees live. As I think about what happens with this 928 greater acres, I think people will come, jobs will come, housing will come because of the interrelationship of those uses. Not that everybody will live in Hanover, Goochland, or Henrico and come into this area, but I think a much greater percentage of the population will be local. We're going to test on that, we're going to talk about that over the next couple months. But I appreciate your attention. Thank you for coming tonight. Council first. Thank you. Oh, oh. Okay, I was going to walk around. I probably didn't wear the right shoes to do that to, um, in order for people to take the mic and ask questions. But I also um, got some feedback via email, and I know I've been meeting with a lot of the surrounding neighborhoods about some of the concerns, so I just want to put them out there um, for thought, because a few people couldn't be at this meeting. Um, but I did want to add that in addition to that smart scale um, bid, that, that smart scale grant that was one to improve the pedestrian bike passages on Arthur Ashe Boulevard. We secured funding from the sale of Blue Bee Cidery um, in the capital budget, which is all local money, and we are working to get the trail that will take you um, roughly from the backside from Rosenith Road all the way around to, to get you up to the Whole Foods. So, um, the Science Museum is putting their portion in. Spy Rock has already started putting their portion of the trail in. That's a, one of the private developers. If you want to see what the trail, the beginning trail looks like, um, it's really nice and interesting. CSX has been working with us and um, very have been very receptive. So um, just wanted to add that because smart scale takes a long time. These interchanges on the expressway will take a long time to get through and then to get actually funded and then engineered and then actually built out is going to take more than a decade, I would say. Um, so I know that there are issues now with the traffic that cuts through neighborhoods and things. So we're, we're working with planning. We're working with Department of Public Works to try to mitigate some of that, but um, some of the questions that have come forward or thoughts that have come forward, um, a comprehensive and independent traffic study to identify and mitigate the traffic impacts of any projects in light of planned density increases along that corridor, um, comprehensive and independent study to determine the effects of this project on Richmond Public Schools, which is not something that planning has been doing so far and schools getting together to talk about some of the impacts of developments, but I think it's really important. And there are some critical um, 
properties that belong to Richmond Public Schools, um, the Arthur Ashe Center being one of them, um, and an assessment by Public Works if the area is served by combined stormwater and sanitary sewer systems. If the development is served to be by combined sewer system, then what will be the impacts on the James River and regional water quality? Um, there are questions about replacement of uh, the Arthur Ashe Center and performance space, the softball fields. Um, this says we need a serious bike pedestrian plan that provides safe passage for both bicyclists and pedestrians that incorporates or addresses opportunities through and around Scott's edition, a bike plan for Route 1 on Hermitage, critical need for a safe bike pedestrian trail on Hermitage, Ash Boulevard, or perhaps through the property, which is what we applied to do with the Smart Scale app application, and recognition of the very serious pedestrian and bike safety issues on Arthur Ash Boulevard, which would potentially increase with any kind of development on the east side of Arthur Ash Boulevard. So, um, finally, where is Sports Packers Stadium in all this? Do they stand to benefit? And so I don't have Sports Packers, anybody from Sports Packers here, but um, I would like to see any hands and throw the questions at Mark. If he, if he can um, answer them now, he will. If not, we'll, we'll be able to post and put all of this information up, and you can continuously give input through the Richmond 300 site, right? right? Yes. Okay. So just, okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious whether or not the city is looking at mm -hmm. tax abatement programs or tax incentive programs for Scott's edition in particular, because what comes from hot and sexy eventually is hot and miserable. <laughs> and so if they go to environmental programs that could be on rooftops and uh, progressive ideas in that direction for uh, tax uh, considerations for those developers. So as far as I know, there have not been any discussions about potential tax abatements for Sustainability, is that what, greening of buildings? Green spaces, have you had any conversations about? Okay, here we go. Uh, on, the, uh, on the pure environmental piece, no, not really. I mean, there's lots of conversations occurring about abatement in the city <clears throat> on a number of fronts, owner-occupied housing, affordable housing, so I think the, the abatement issue will ultimately work itself out. One of the things that I've been pushing, but obviously not pushing hard enough because I haven't done enough work on it to make it possible, is how we might play with some of the zoning in this area that would make it possible for green space to be a part of more developments rather than less. I really wanted the handcraft parking lot to be the park of Scott's edition. Uh, and so, but again, we've got thousands of people. How do we, what do we do? And I think we need to think past the, the um, past the balcony. So I think on open space, there might be some land use things we can tweak to help make things happen. But we'll put down, we got, we're, we're, we're jotting down notes about what's happened, what the discussion is here tonight. We'll put environmental abatement on one of the topics. Rooftop. I'm talking more particularly about using those big commercial spaces and those industrial buildings to put uh, community gardens and uh, green spaces uh, that could cool it down uh, and capture water and do those kinds of things, knowing that we're not getting any cooler uh, in the summertime. So this could probably help. I would certainly love to see more of that. Before I was in Richmond, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, and we had green roofs and uh, rooftop units all over all the new development that was occurring. We've given special consideration on timing to review plans for those. We just haven't seen as much as we'd like. I keep hoping we'll see more. Okay. Anybody? Is, is anyone um, thought? Is anyone thought of moving sports backers? 
The question was moving sports backers over to the Redskins practice facility. Have not heard that one. As the council person said, there's lots of moving parts in this entire area. I'm not expecting it all to happen next week or next year. Obviously, if you're going to develop the Boulevard, the Arthur Ashe Dining site to its full opportunity, there will need to be discussions about what happens with sports veterans. I'm not aware that that may be happening above my favor. Has there been any discussion with Virginia Union with um, the Arthur Ashe Center in terms of renovation and then possibly maybe moving from off campus to play their games again there? At Arthur Ashe for Arthur Ashe and the re renovate Arthur Ashe and Virginia Union moving back into Arthur Ashe. Not that I'm aware of, but we've been trying to have more conversations with VUU as part of the, the, the work we're doing just on the other side of the interstate uh, in their neighborhood. Good comment. Haven't had that discussion yet. Hey, Mark. I know it's not easy to get the open space or create that really interesting place that creates community like you're talking about, but mm -hmm. if it's going to be relatively easier, it is in that 900 plus acre triangle. Mm -hmm. So my question is kind of twofold. One, roughly what percentage of that triangle would be taken up theoretically by a VCU if they move on that? And then um, you, secondly, other than, the, than just the kind of the planning and permit process, how, how much of the rest of that does the, the, the city or government control to, to potentially create a big kind of impactful place or open space? So roughly we, the city owns this area right here. The VCU, kind of the discussion that has occurred, the thing that the council person put out about where a baseball stadium and other sports facility is right here at the ABC site. So, you know, we own the 60 acres, that is, we, the city of Richmond. I think as we think about what happens, if we, you know, we went out for an RFQ, that's kind of not going anywhere, the idea is that maybe we issue an RFP. And I make the pitch that I think if we're gonna go in that direction, we need to think more holistically about what happens on that 60 acres, and as I said before, I think open space is a part of that. The other thing that I think we need to think about is, you know, we all look and see, well, here's Arthur Ashe, and here's Hermitage, and we got this big vacant spot, and we got, you know, what, what is the street network that we will ultimately see in this area over the next 20 years? I think it's a great conversation to have, because it could go any one of any number of ways, but I take at the end of the day, is if you're really wanting to think about how we centralize some open space for this entire area, something in that area might be the place we put it. And as we think about improving those transportation connections, it's easier to get among those four quadrants than it is today. Hello there. It's really important that in the area that has no street Grid, that the street grid be restored. We totally agree with you 100%. Now, what that grid looks like, because there wasn't a grid there, so we're recreating a grid. I mean, we're creating a grid, not putting back what was in portions. I'll give you a, a little example where the sour for holdings are. We vacated Mar West Marshall Street between Hermitage and the old Putney building, the old state tax. They made improvements <coughs> excuse us, to the driveway in and to Marshall, but there is a perpetual easement for public access and use. So it's not city-owned property, and it's not city-owned right-of-way, but people can use it. So I think we need to think creatively about how we do these things as we think about this larger area to get that grid to make it easier for people to get from point A to point B. How do we handle deliveries and trash and all the other things that comes with redevelopment? And it's a great comment and one we're very interested in. Okay, and this is not my question, but I was wondering if you could clarify what nodal use is. I don't know what that means. 
So think of it as a focus of activity that doesn't presently exist. <laughs> so we got this nine, we got this big area that bits and pieces of it are starting to come along. So I would suggest that we got a bit of a middle center in part, large parts of Scott's edition. But as we think about the balance of that larger area, what happens? Is it four neighborhoods? Is it six neighborhoods? Is it eight neighborhoods? And how do you... So one of the things is maybe we just don't think about it as one neighborhood. We think of it as a series of smaller neighborhoods that have their own specific little nodes that people gather around and do things with. And if I could, for just one moment, talk about schools. We're going to meet with them in a couple weeks to talk about their rezoning study and our master plan. We don't have alignment on the future population of the city of Richmond, number one. Number two is I have no clue, because I haven't been to any meetings, when I start building, and they've extended those rezoning meetings, so I have to get them on my calendar. But let's just say, for argument's sake, we get 15, 20,000 people living over here over the next 20 years in this about roughly 1,000 acres. At some point, some of them may want to have kids. Some of them may want to stay in the neighborhood. And if we've got the level of activity, what do schools look like in that neighborhood that might be different than what we've got now? You know, other cities are putting schools in mixed-use developments. They're putting fire station in mixed-use developments. I think we need to think creatively about what the character of this area is and the buildings that get built in this area over time so that if kids do show up, there's a place for them to go and they don't have to get bussed all over the place to get an education. Okay. Okay. Well, my question is about the, um, um, the area north of the interchange, um, Sherwood Park and Gitter Park, Rosedale. Um, there are several Sherwood Park people here, and um, and I mean I'm hoping I don't know where my comments going to go, but I'm hoping that that you all will pay attention to how our little uh, sort of isolated pocket, and I'll, I'll speak specific, specifically of Sherwood Park. Um, you know how we access this area because right now and we've got some restaurants and you know ice cream places, all these things developing, but where it's it's pretty treacherous to get from our neighborhood to the Diamond, to Kitchen 64, to Gelati, you know, I mean anywhere. It's um, there. It's it's not pedestrian friendly. So I, I like hearing that you know the pedestrian and bike plan is 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 on the table, but um, but I think it's very important. And we've got you know. I think it's still shown on the Richmond 300 plan that um, the apartments are, I think it's showing um, medium density residential, and I'd argue that that's a little more than medium, re um, medium density, that there would be more people, and probably a lot of single people living there who, who want to access the Arthur Ashe Boulevard and Scott's Edition area. Which apartments are you talking about? The Canopy. Ah. The 301. So, uh, we all understand that the intersection there where Kitchen 64 and all of that is, is a complicated intersection. Um, I think that will need to get addressed as we have the conversation beat out about what happens with the interchange. We had a meeting yesterday among DPW, PDR, and park staff about the, uh, you've heard about it, the Ashland to Petersburg Trail. We're exploring a number of options about what that route might look like, and one of them that has been kind of pitched out there for consideration was going through that intersection. None of us sitting at that table figures out how you could do that easily or well. So we're looking at all options. We understand that intersection is complex uh, and complicated, and I think and I, I'm not a VDOT official, nor am I the city's transportation engineer, but I do know that there are some things you have to go through with VDOT that if you are doing development within a quarter mile or a half mile, or whatever it is, of an interchange, you've got to show that the, the development activity will not crash the interchange. So we're sensitive to that, and we'll make sure as we go through this process that that is factored into whatever comes out of the plan.
whether I will say this, I'm not 100% sure, in fact, I'm pretty sure that I'm 100% sure that I'm not sure what's going on north of the interstate will be no mixed use. If you understand that, I'm going to give you a buck. Because <laughs> I just, I'm not sure it's a very different character on the other side of the interstate than on this, on, in, on this side of the interstate. And so I'm not sure it actually rises to the level of no, or be much, it might be something much more modest in scale because of the activities that are occurring around it. Hi, you doing? Uh, being that so many areas and neighborhoods are being affected by these developmental projects, uh, do you have in mind uh, how exactly you're going to fund these projects and that they are able to be funded and sustainable uh, throughout the development of these projects? Because it's going to take more than just a few years to complete these and to see something, the start of something great and not to be finished, and uh, say tax dollars being uh, put towards this, I wouldn't want to see that my tax dollars being started on something and not finished. That is a great question, and the only way I can answer that, the only way I can answer that really, is, as I mentioned early on, the master plan is supposed to inform capital budgets and public spending. So if, if, as this process goes through, and ultimately the council adopts Richmond 300, there needs to be the discussion that if you want this to happen here or anywhere else in the city, what are the public investment strategies we need to have to help make that a reality in the long run? So I'm 100% uh, in agreement with you that if we're going to go down a path in this area, whatever the path that is, we all need to be committed to seeing it through in a way that when we look back on it in 2037, it all makes sense. It's a net value added for the city. And as I like to say as we go through this process, the Fan's a great neighborhood, Inner Park's a great neighborhood, Museum District's a great neighborhood, I just bought a house at Oakwood, so Oakwood is a great neighborhood. But. I'd like this to be a great neighborhood so that in 50 years, people are saying, man, those guys got it right. And we created this new neighborhood out of whole cloth that didn't exist in 2019, but it works because we thought through open space and people and sustainability and pedestrian bike safety and access and how do we join all of that together so it is part of the larger Richmond community. But your point is well taken. We can't just do phase one, declare victory and go home. Got another question. Um, I wanted to know what procedure exactly do you follow to bring or Court businesses to come to town. I have a relative who's obsessed with Wegmans. And every time you go down Brook Road, she's from Northern Virginia. Every time you go down Brook Road, she's looking at where the old Azalea Mall used to be. And it's like, I don't know why they can't put a Wegmans there. So, what kind of procedure would have to happen to get a Wegmans? Well, that, on Brook Road. Man, that's a great question. And in one of the pages, <laughs> In one of the supplemental materials we did as part of the background as we launched this project, mm -hmm. we worked with VCU on seven neighborhoods and said how many people would need to be in this general neighborhood okay. to support either a small grocery store or a larger grocery store. Yeah. In the site of Azalea Mall, is there a Kroger nearby or something on it? The question will be how many people are within a two mile, five mile, ten mile tray area What's their household income? Mm -hmm. And whether or not Wakeman's thinks, given the other grocery competition in the area, why will it work? Fulan. <laughs> Fulan and Don. I had somebody tell me the other day they love the fact that Whole Foods is coming to the neighborhood because Whole Foods is the driver of Trader Joe's. So if a Whole Foods is there, a Trader Joe's might find itself somewhere in the vicinity in the not too distant future. Kind of like the old McDonald's. Everybody wanted to be where McDonald's was. So when I think about walkability and mixed use and uh, new opportunities, uh, I also think about um, the upcoming, park the upcoming parking day. Uh, 
in, in a couple months we'll have the opportunity mm -hmm. to use city parking spaces for something other than cars. Mm -hmm. And I think about Scott's addition not having any parks and having nice wide streets that are city owned. Uh, could we do something different in this neighborhood, perhaps in the new development where we're mm -hmm. using streets to provide that green space, uh, especially infilling that green space? So that's a great question. And quick two responses. Um, where? Uh, the question is, could we do a parking day activity in Scott's Edition? The answer to first is yes. And if you give me your contact information at the conclusion of the meeting, I'll tell you who to contact because we're looking, we're scouting locations right now. And, and we're actually going to try to fund some parklets this year in Scott's Edition. I'll find you after this. Hallelujah. Because the second thing I wanted to mention is we adopted a, an ordinance a few years ago for the concept of parklets. If you go to other cities, you'll see them where they carve out a few parking spaces for some informal open space for po folks that's not otherwise there. We got, we got a feeler from either Saba or somebody in Scott's edition about doing one and maybe making it mobile where it could move from location to location. We have yet to get one parklet application. I would love to see Scott's Edition be the first to do something, but we're very supportive of both of those items and would love to see a parklet happen in the area elsewhere in the community and sometime over the next couple of years. Saba is a good place to, if you have those ideas, their website, um, shoot them an email because they are working on trees and parklets right now and they have some funding available to do that so I guess what I wanted to follow up on is not just a temporary thing or a one-day thing but changing the structure of streets to have less parking and more green space well we they are working on a plan with that and we're looking at other potential locations for green space so I would suggest to you when are we headed is it August 19th August 5th when's uh, August 19th um, Desmond, who did the parking study for us, is coming back into town to make their presentation on the parking study they did for the seven neighborhoods. Scott's edition is one of them. That will be at room 511 of City Hall in our conference room. And I think if anybody has any interest in hearing more about parking in Scott's edition, please feel free to join us at that time because I think it will be an interesting discussion. The other thing we're doing, and I forgot to mention, as part of the Desmond study, we also had some funding available to look at conversion of the one-way streets to two-way. And that's a, a separate track, but it's linked with the parking study. Um, and we think there are ways to do more in Scott's Edition rather than what's there now, because I don't know what street any business I frequent in Scott's Edition is on. I drive around until I find it, because I don't know what any of the street names are, and I don't know how to get from point A to point B, so I just get on more, or I get on uh, Rosemead and just hunt and peck. And our hope would be to make it more rational, so people aren't hunting and pecking and driving around the city and uh, driving through the neighborhood, which I think tends to make it a little less safe because people are trying to figure out where they want to get and they're not paying it up as, enough, as much attention as they should to what's happening. Um, is there a timeline at all on the ballpark being, you know, breaking ground on the ballpark? And is there any pressure from the Giants organization? Because, you know, we obviously lost the Braves and it would be great to wait until we have a plan for that area, but is there a chance that they could just kind of leave us hanging? Leave us hanging, meaning leave? Yeah, as in the Giants organization leaving town. Those conversations are happening at a different level than we are. I know council passed last night an extension to the lease for the existing stadium for the, the squirrels, so I'm hoping they're here there's obviously been activity at the state that is clearing a path or showing a path for something to happen at the ABC <laughs> warehouse site. Um, and so I'm going to guess at some point that'll all work itself out. Uh, and we'll be, our goal is to have a plan ready so that when it does work itself out, we can move to implementation. Do you know when the lease is through? What your lease is through? Councilperson Gray might recollect those numbers from last night. I think it's a five or ten year lease, but it's annually done. Yeah. So um, I 
so many things came past us last night. I don't know 100%, but I can get you a solid answer. And I, can I seem you. to recall three years and two one-year extensions for like a five-year extension, so like 20 right. through 25 or something like that. Something. So we got a few years left to go. At least five. Um, Space. We're talking a lot about it, but we need to figure out how that green space can be taken care of. And we need to think about the people who are living near that green space be required to help take care of it. Rather than pushing it off on the city and saying, it's not my responsibility. Ma'am, are you referring to the green space in front of the Science Museum? Every, every green space that we have in the city. So right now... Right e now every green space. Oh, well, city-wide. Trees, trees, parks, anything that is green space. So I can't speak for the Science Museum. Rich is right beside you, and Rich can speak for the Science Museum, and he's going to take care of it. But I, I totally agree. But you know, we've we this has come up in the, you know, we've got. I know there's lots of people who don't like the conservancy, but there is a Monroe Park Conservancy who's trying to take some of the pressure off parks maintenance to provide for Monroe Park. There are lots of models out there. Rich talked about Bryant Park. There's a Bryant Park Conservancy in New York that manages Bryant Park and does more than the City Parks Department would do to help get it to a level of, of um, activity and cleanliness and safety. Locally, besides Monroe Park Conservancy, uh, we've worked very closely with Capitol Trees to do the low line along Dock Street. And if you've been along Dock and on the Capitol Trail, I think Capitol Trees has done a magnificent job of creating that passive green space along the canal. When I came here in 11, I used to joke, that's where the, you fished bodies out of the canal. Um, and now it's like this great asset for that part of the city. So I think, duly noted, there's opportunities, but like a lot of things, if I'm saying I can't maintain it so I don't want to put it in, that forecloses a lot of options to us in the long run. I would hate to say we don't want parks because we can't maintain them. I think we say we want parks, we need to figure out how to maintain them. And I think that's the challenge for all of us over the next X number of years. <laughs> Mark, um, I am interested in knowing what the mechanisms are for defining the character of development along Arthur Ashe Boulevard, particularly as we look at um, the tricky business of redesigning Exit 78. Um, and I, as much as I appreciate the um, convenience of the Wawa, I'll use that as an example of the possibility of um, Pull the mic up. You know, being wooed by developers and, and then losing all sense of where you are. I think we've got a really unique opportunity to be very much uh, a, a place that is defining your first experience of Richmond. And um, I, I just, you know, I, I really worry about us beginning to look more and more like every interstate exchange along the 95 corridor and I, I, I wonder what protections can be put in place or what guidances will be there um, to give that particular <coughs> interchange a, a very specific uh, expression of who we are as a community. Um, that is a great question. The simple answer is we adopt a plan that gives us direction as it relates to the uses we want to see along this corridor and then we do the necessary zoning to help make that a reality we had lots of conversations just we had lots of conversations with Wawa the first one was we don't really think you belong here but there I mean I don't and I and I and I said that only because of the character of what we wanted to see again not another off-ramp gas station 
but they were zoned to allow it to occur. And so what we did last night in, in um, Monroe Ward is we changed the zoning where some of those things we just don't think fits in an urbanizing neighborhood should be there as a primary use got changed because of the plan. And I think that's what we need to do on the north side of the river. We need, or the, or the bridge and the railroad tracks, is what's that essential character that we want to have in this area, and what is that character along this corridor so that when you get off the uh, interstate, it does not look like every other interchange. I think Wawa would say to you, Randy, that this was a unique site, and we they we they bent over backwards. And there's some things they did that I think are pretty nice. But it's at the end of the day, is that what we want in that area as we think about this area transitioning? And that's why planning is important, and following up the planning is on that. So we have several more questions. So if we can, oh, we got one up here. Uh, yeah, I just questions about the uh, 60 acre boulevard site. Mm -hmm. And either from a policy or a planning perspective, what are the pros and cons of maintaining city ownership of that versus selling it to private development? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, from a, from a policy standpoint, I don't know. We haven't had those conversations one way or the other yet. Um, I know. Cities around the country have done it different ways, so there are different models out there we can look at. What was your second question? I just wanted to know uh, uh, what your opinion was on whether it was better to sell the land or maintain ownership of it as we go forward. And it may be beyond the scope of planning. Well, it, it, I mean, at some point we have to think about, so we create a great plan, and again, as I've said, this is like the second most important most talked about piece of the Richmond 300 plan. So I think as we think about implementation, all of those cards will need to be on the table as we think about what happens to help make that a reality. I don't know if that has been formed yet, but it's a great question. Just a quick response to that. I think that's part of why I wanted to have these sessions because I think it's an opportunity for us to dream a little bigger. It's city on 60 acres and maybe we can do something creative with a private developer or someone you know that allows for us to get the taxes because that's really important and that also allows us to have some community uses or some creative things that that serve us in perpetuity as well so if we're giving it up we need to be thinking now about what kinds of things we'd like to see in exchange so the timing of this meeting is really um, good because VDOT recently uh, launched a survey um, statewide about the interstate corridor and we have a lot of really great comments tonight so maybe you can share the link to that survey because that would be a really great way for that information that everybody has in the room and the concerns um, and just data that they're collecting um, you know that we can get that feedback directly to where it may really count in the end because I know you're limited as a counselor on what you can do and planners are limited on what they can do. Um, my other question is, um, I know that there was a meeting back in May where this was discussed and it was sort of cost prohibitive for a lot of people because it was about $60 a ticket. Could you share with us what, what, what was discussed in that meeting? Like was it the same planning issue or was it like developers? Um, maybe just kind of share with us what was discussed then. So are you referring to the BizSense forum that they put on? So there, and it was, streamed and it's on their it's on their um, website you can link to it and hear all the comments but it was more of a discussion on what um, I think there was VCU's head of athletics was there um, Parney from the squirrels we had spy rock um, Andrew Basham on the panel um, who's a developer and a major developer in Scott's edition and um, the mayor and a uh, were there just to answer questions from the audience but it's similar to this it was a little more focused specifically on the squirrel site and the VCU sites and the sports tourism opportunities that there are so and there was a discussion about infrastructure needs which we know um, any major developments will require major 
city infrastructure, stormwater, sewer lines, things like that, and what what kinds of things will need to happen to make that financially work if it's tax incremental financing some way or if there's some abatement program and things like that. So we didn't go too in depth, but if you want to see it, I'm pretty certain Richmond Business has it up on their site and they had a, a place for people to ask questions online and I can get you that information. There were about roughly seven, eight hundred people that sold out pretty quickly and it was not our forum, but I will go to any forum and anywhere that folks are asking me to talk about issues impacting this district. So I say yes. Kim? Several years ago, there were discussions about the high speed rail that might pass through this area. Um, is that an issue at all in this uh, work that's being talked about now? So I haven't had a chance to read the, the latest draft environmental impact statement on high-speed rail. The idea has been it will be the two-station solution. So in Ryko Station out in Staples Mill will exist, and um, Main Street Station will exist. They will go through the area on the existing, what I believe to be within the existing framework of the rails that are there. Got to get around all the Aki Yard stuff. But our take is that will not significantly affect what happens here uh, because it will be great separated and with all the other railroad tracks that are there. Are there more questions? And I'm drawing a blank. The Scott's Edition Boulevard Association website is, is it Saba.org? Yeah. Scottsedition.org? Yeah. Okay, so that's a really good place. We're going to make sure. And then the, the city's planning site, Richmond300.com. We're going to upload all the documents that we have um, referenced today and any other links, um, the VDOT information we can put up there and make sure that people have all the information that they need. And we want to hear your feedback. We want to hear, and if you don't feel comfortable speaking in this forum, you can please feel free to call me um, or call our office. My number is 804-852-4427. I am available and ready to hear your desires and concerns and any other plans that you might think would look great along the Author Ash Boulevard corridor. There's our contact information. I would like to give, before we wrap, because I don't have a chance to do this very often on a public venue, but I do want to give um, a shout out. I don't know if guys at 63 do shout outs, but I do want to pay compliments to um, the Saba group um, and all the people who call this neighborhood home. Um, the value of the volunteerism that I have seen in the almost eight years I've been here as it relates to things like trash cans and trees and litter pickups and thinking differently about how life goes on in this 930 acre piece is really pretty extraordinary. I wanted to commend everybody who lives in the vicinity of this um, to say thank you as a municipal employee for the dedication and the volunteerism that you all do on a regular basis to make these areas um, likely places to be and places where people want to visit. So I just want to say thank you to all for that. And I want to thank, in addition to us, we have several Scots Edition board members. What we have Sherwood Park represented, Ginner Park, Laburnum Park, Rosedale. We've got a lot of neighborhoods here, West Grace. Um, the Fan District, Monument Avenue, um, Jackson Ward, yes, can't forget that. So we have um, a lot of, and Carver, and Newtown, and we have a lot of really good energy, and I want to make sure that we are harnessing that and doing the best we can and coming out with some good ideas, keeping an open mind, and we hopefully can end up with the very best design plan that is 
possible in this universe. So um, please stay tuned, and we will be planning another meeting. I'm thinking September, October-ish, um, similar to this one. But we'll um, also be asking VCU at some point um, when they're once they've gotten their approval through the General Assembly, which won't be until next year, to potentially do a con a conversation similar to this with the community as well and maybe some preliminary ones and they might join us at one of our meetings to discuss what their plans are but i think they're in the preliminary stages of trying to acquire the abc property so they weren't ready to discuss anything in this venue right now feel free to go to richmond300.com get on the email list so that you are notified when we have all of these other community conversations and public meetings on the next stage of the draft of the plan. So you can come here to that and make your um, feelings known. Mark, can I put in a little plug for next Monday night? We're having the Richmond 300 Working Group Summit, yep. where all five of the working groups are going to report back to the Advisory Council. That's next. So that's next uh, Monday night from 4 to 7. You can just You'll hear a report back from all of the five working groups to the advisory council as to where they're going before we go to the public in September for our public meeting. But that meeting next Monday night is going to be probably one of the most informative meetings that you can come to if you're going to work on the Richmond 300 for the master plan. That's held where? It's held at the city library, main city library. So. Next Monday, what time again? Four to seven. Four to seven, main library downtown, lower level. Well, no, we're taking over everywhere, practically, right? Yeah. Yep. There's opportunities. Okay, well, uh, everybody give yourselves a round of applause for being civically engaged this evening. Thanks to uh, Councilman Gray and Mark for coming down, and thank you for visiting the Science Museum of Virginia. Please come back soon, um, and we'll see you have a safe way home. <laughs>